G'day miners, this is Peter Finn. Welcome to Full Production. In this podcast, Pete talks everything mining. A podcast dedicated to the mining industry in the Australian Pacific region. From production to development, and most importantly, employment opportunities of the industry's biggest project. And here is your host, Peter Finn. G'day guys, this is Steph welcoming you back to the Full Production Podcast. In this episode, Pete chats to Adam Bean, or Beanie, who's a construction superintendent turned marketing superintendent. Also known as a social tradie, Beanie breaks down marketing into effective tactics for fellow tradies, FIFO workers, and the like. In this episode, Adam and Pete talk about his background and how he went from tradie to master of the modern business landscape. I'll turn it over to Pete and Adam. Adam, take two, three. How many is that? Yep, <laughs> two. Like. Two. Uh, we'll blame your audio gear since you're the since you're the guest. <laughs> yeah, that's it, <laughs> <laughs> mate. Um, me and you have been mates for a while, and we've been talking for a bit. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I think I've probably pulled out on you once or twice, haven't I? Oh, uh, mate, you know how it is. Life happens. Yeah. It's all sorts of shit goes on, particularly uh, stuff like what's going on at the minute. Yeah, mate. Well, the I, I, reason why I'm knocking out a lot of podcasts and we're getting a real good chance to catch up is because it's uh, – well, I'm in New Zealand, so we're in full lockdown because of the COVID-19. Um, you guys in Australia not too far away, I don't think, are you? Oh, mate, there's a lot of memes going around where it's like uh, you can go to the shops, but you can't go to the shops and they can't really make a decision. I'll tell you the truth, i um if we could get Jacinda to take over over here as well as over there, yeah. it'd be a lot better off, I think. Yeah, she, she's, a, she's a pretty good leader, eh? She's very, real relatable. Doesn't feel like she's selling out when she talks, and she's very dis, uh, decisive, you know. And uh, I don't know, unfortunately for ScoMo, uh, fuck, he's had a bad run too since he started. Um, but end of the day, it just doesn't come across that well from a reception point of view, does it? No, mate. I'll, uh, you nailed it. Absolutely nailed it there when you said she's decisive. She makes a decision and she goes, this is the decision. This is the way we're moving forward and this is what we're going to do. And it's very clear what's going to happen. Mm. And that's just not happening here. There was they're making decisions like, I oh, will do this, but and accept in this circumstance. And we'll probably get into this a bit later on. Is It's a very important part of leadership is having a clear direction and letting people have confidence that you know exactly where you're going. Mm. Mate, we, we did talk it before this podcast. We weren't going to turn into a, um, a coronavirus podcast, so we'll um, no. we'll, we'll get keep into moving. it. Keep yeah. moving. We'll keep moving, brother, because by the time we finish this podcast, we'll be in a different uh, set of rules again anyway. Um, That's it. Mate, I don't know what your specialty is. Is it? Are you a specialised boiler maker? Are you specialised? Yeah, boiler- Sorry, yeah, boiler maker by trade. Yeah. So I started the trade back, oh, I don't know, it was about 1988 now. Yeah. Um, Went into basically because um, I had to get out of school. I hated school. I, was, uh, I got to the end of grade 10, but my old man said, you're not going to Woolworths to push trolleys. So he said, you've got to find yourself an apprenticeship. Uh, started as a chippy, that fell over, and then a boiler mate and apprenticeship come up. So, yeah, that was it, mate. That was how, how the decision was made. Mm, very good, mate. Uh, where, where, where did you grow up, Mommy Arkson? How was that growing up life-wise? Yeah, it was really good. I mean, I was pretty lucky. I um, had great parents that um, supported me no matter what I did. We, I was actually born in Gladstone. Yep. Um, we moved from there back down to uh, my granddad was really crook and my mum was a nurse, so she came back to um, nursing through his last 12 months, which was just sort of on the outskirts, was actually on a horse race along stud, so that was a fun time. Um, we did that, and then we moved into sort of between um, Ipswich and Brisbane, mate. So I grew up around that area, an area called um, Collingwood Park. So always been a proud Queenslander by the sounds of it, mate? Oh, 100%, mate, 100%, yeah. yeah. What what you all men do for a living? Uh, Dad was a fitter by trade. He actually did his trade in the Air Force. He was an airframe fitter. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the principles that I got, well, I actually did, half of my apprenticeship under him and he was one of the ones that taught me how to and I think this is where we miss the boat a lot these days he's actually taught us how to work and how to work effectively and productively yeah how, how was that working with the old man I, I obviously oh. <laughs> I got my own stories but working with my old man but I'm sure everybody has their own let alone you back in the 80s yeah well, yeah look he was fucking tough don't worry about that um, Smoko was, Smoko was from 9 o'clock till 9.15. Your ass didn't hit the seat until 9 o'clock and you, you're back out, of, you know, exactly on the dot of 9.15. There's a couple of other lads that 
did their apprenticeships with me. One lives here on the coast as well, and we still, every time we catch up for a beer or whatever, we still talk and joke about it. But, um, you know, it set us up for what we've done post working for him. Yeah, how, how important do you feel them foundations are for you now when you reflect on life to what you do and who you are now? Mate, it's absolutely vital for me um, to have that responsibility for yourself and you start looking at some of these books. I do a lot of reading and you look at there's one uh, guy called Jocko Willink and he talked about, we were just talking about leadership before and he's talking about in the Navy, he's an ex-Navy SEAL and he's talking about stream ownership. So yeah, one well, of their sayings is there's no shit teams, there's just shit leaders. Yep. And I think that's 100% true. Look, you might not always be responsible for everything that goes on or everything that goes wrong, but you have a responsibility to fix it. And it, and it breeds that uh, mindset, that mentality that, you know, I need to do something to fix this, whether this is my problem or not. You know, someone that was working for me has either created or has this problem. So I've got a level of responsibility to help them fix it. It's a long book too. I've, I've listened to it. Yeah, it is. It is. It's um. There's there's two of them. There was the extreme ownership, and then the second one I think was the one that I read. But um, it really makes you think. It really makes you reassess what what you do, how you do it, and every every little action that you take. You know, that he points out in there, someone's watching you all the time. So you have to really be careful about what you not not be careful. But you need to make sure that you're you're walking your talk. Yeah, there's one story in there that I recall. I, I, I've only done the extreme ownership, and I listened to a couple of uh, Jocko's got a podcast. I'm pretty sure as well, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, mate. He does yeah. yeah, and he talks about how they had um, friendly on friendly fire over in um, Baghdad, and um, how everyone was thought that it was going to be a big shitstorm from the investigation. And he walked in and took ownership for the whole lot. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, no, it's it's a definitely an interesting book to how they perceive the world. Them guys, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, it does. Like when they get to their, his level, he he believe he might not even be out on the battlefield. And I, I know the example you're talking about there, and I'm pretty sure that he wasn't. He was overseeing it from um, far away, uh, like a general type position. But as you said, he walked in and took uh, ownership of the thing and, and took control of the situation and turned it around. Mate, you, you've um was reading. Did you read a lot as a kid? And you like you seem like you've read a lot of books as well. Look, uh, it was, again, as it comes back to your parents and the habits that they set for you early on, and one of the things that my mum always did with me from a little fellow was read to me a lot. And uh, up till the age of about seven or eight or something, yeah, I used to always have my um, nose in a book, but then I went to school and they sort of destroyed it for me. It, you know, it's people like yourself, you and I, and I always said my best supervisor spent more time sitting outside the headmaster's office than they did in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. And... It sort of killed it for me then, and then I didn't read probably from, oh, I don't know, from about seven or eight right up to maybe early 20s, maybe even later, nearly my 30s, but it's something that I picked back up. And, um, yeah, it is a ritual. It's a habit now. Every day I'll, I'll read something. Yeah, good, mate. I'm obviously not the best reader, but I, I listen to a lot of audio books and I take notes. So there's um, a lot of excuses you can make for not reading a book because you can't read that well. well. I've got a lot of mates that say it and I say, mate, get on an audio book and then they say, oh, I can't comprehend it. And the only way you can really comprehend a good audio book is sit there with a notepad, listen to it and write down things as it comes up. Yeah, there is a lot. With all the tech that we've got today, today's day and age is fantastic, but there is actual scientific research behind what you're exactly what you're saying there about how it sticks so much better when you actually – write that down physically. So, yeah, that's a really important point, actually. Mate, um, sorry, I'll get back on the career. I knew we'd go down a rabbit hole pretty quickly, <laughs> me and you, my friend. Um, being a boiler maker, um, I guess um, you've been on plenty of infrastructure and construction projects for your career. Yeah, mate, yep. Um, what, basically, as soon as I come out of my apprenticeship, I got into construction type projects, I suppose. I was never really a um, – an old man used to do a lot of site work when apprentices. I was never really a stay in a workshop type person. So I went up to Cairns. We did a um, uh, pontoon for Quicksilver up there. And then I got into construction. Basically, I've done that ever since. Time ago, aluminium smelter, boring smelter I worked on. And then fortunately cracked my way into oil and gas as well. So I've worked on it, you know, Darwin LNG, uh, Pluto B when they did the expansion, Gorgon, Barrel Island. I think so, that well, I think we, we talked about this one time having a beer in Brisbane there that um, we might even work on the same project together because you have done underground as well. 
Um, I have, mate. I have, yeah. Back, um, did a job for Cadia back in about 2010 was an underground system, uh, conveyor system, yep. the crushes and stuff. Yeah. So A big job too, wasn't it? It was, mate. It was. And it's a great little town as well. It's like when you talk about residential uh, mining, it's not something I could ever do long term because it's too far away from the beach. I like, I like the uh, salt water and the sand. But Orange was like my kids, uh, one's 22 now. She's been over in the UK for two years, just come back to Melbourne. Yeah, my young fella's 19. And I still talk about Orange and then they're always planning on going back there for holiday. They absolutely love that little town. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice town and a, and a very nice region in general, isn't it? It is, mate. It is. Well, you've just got access to so much stuff from there. You know, you've been in Sydney an hour and a half. Um, you can go out to Canawindra. There's heaps of nice places around there as well. Yeah. You um, ever done any more underground hard rock projects outside that? Because that's a pretty decent sized project to have on your resume. You ever do any more after that? I haven't, mate. I've never got, but that was with um, RCR that yeah. I did that one project. I only stayed with them for that one, and that's sort of their special. That was how I got into it. That was their specialty, basically, was doing crushes and underground systems. And they've, since what, well, they tried to go into, um, Project work they didn't really know a lot about, I suppose, was probably part of the problem, but they ended up um, going broke, as we all know. Yeah, you but, did just uh, recently too, wasn't it? Like a year or so ago now? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I think it was either last year or just the year before. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But I think some of their, I think maybe one or so of their divisions stayed alive. Possibly, quite possibly. Yeah. I think there's something still over in the West. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the majority, like all the girls that I knew that were RCR have all moved on now. Well, Basically, they jumped to, I think, a couple of the guys that were um, pretty much the leads there, directors or whatever, have moved into another sort of set up something, else, something, else, something somewhere else, nowhere near on the scale that RCR has, but I think they're doing down doing that Carapatina project now. Oh, yeah, it's a reasonable size one as well, mate. You, um, what, What's the difference? Like, I've never done much oil and gas and, and them sort of projects. And by the sounds of it, you've done everything from pontoons for surf comps right down to uh, the biggest underground construction that I've ever been involved with, which is Cadia East, and you've done oil and gas. How different are we, oil and gas, mining? Mate, it's basically for me, it comes back to mentality uh, and what's accepted in one industry is not necessarily accepted in another one. Oil and gas is particularly stringent or, and a, um, because of a lot of it goes back to, I don't know if you've ever heard of, there was an incident in the um, North Sea years, years ago called Pipe Alpha and uh, where a rig burnt down. Uh, it was like one of the biggest well, probably incidents of major catastrophes in the industry uh, back in the 80s, I think it was. And so it's become really, really, really stringent in oil and gas. Uh, not that it's any more dangerous than any other industry. It's just that the, they've had that incident, so they've built all of their um, systems and their processes off of the back of that. Whether that's the best thing or not is debatable because sometimes you put too much in and you restrict people and, you know, at the end of the day we have to get things built and we have to get rock out of the ground and all the rest of it. So basically it, it, the only real difference between, between the two is it comes back to – what, what systems and procedures are in place and um, the mentality of the people that follow those systems and procedures. Yeah. The guys, though, like from a camaraderie point of view, quite similar? But the, I find, again, we come back to leadership, okay? It, I find it comes back to the quality of the leadership that you got. It will depend on the camaraderie that you got on the floor. I know I've got a certain group of supervisors that follow me basically everywhere I go. I've taken with me. Some have worked with me since back before 2010, worked for me for years and years and years. So it's like a football team, uh, when you get a really good football team that works together and plays together and they're there to three or four years, they're almost unbeatable. Yeah. And it's the same in construction. It, it's a team. And it depends on how those guys lead and create the culture as to how, what sort of camaraderie you get. It's not better in any one field, the mining and oil and gas to mining to anywhere else. But it comes back to the, well, for me, it all comes back to the mentality of those of the supervisors. They're, they're the front line guys. Yeah. No, well, they're everything. They're the ones that create the environment. What do you look for when you go work on projects, mate? Do you look for, look at the project manager? I guess you've got a lot of mates now in the game too. Do you just follow certain project managers around? 
Definitely, mate. If there's, there's a project manager or a construction manager going that I know that I've worked with before, and a lot of a lot of the work that I get follows on from that. It's people that I've worked with previously, and we've already built those relationships. We know how each other works. They know that they'll bring me in because they want a skirt, certain skill set, and they don't have to worry about if they give me whatever they got to give me. It'll just go away, and it'll get done. And that flows on down the line. The supervisors that will work for me are exactly the same. But yeah, 100%, you'll always go to a project first where you know the people, you know how they operate, and you're comfortable with what they do and how they do it. Yeah, it's not what you do, it's who you do it for. Exactly, mate, exactly. I mean, some people, you know, I've always said there's some. There's one guy in particular that I work with who we've worked back-to-back. And, man, he could stand up at the gates of hell and go, boys, we're going straight through that way. And every single one that knows him would be right behind him. Yet I've got other guys, other people that have been in leadership positions, and, I, and I've even said this to him. I said, mate, you wouldn't get anyone to follow you to the bus at knockoff dawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all know them guys. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, mate, it's funny how you meet people too. Like I, I got a situation now where a lot of my mates who are engineers or you know work from different parts over the world are now becoming bosses as well and key decision makers. You know, it's funny. Even one guy that I told him what I thought of him a few times. Um, you know, even him that he's now a boss, and um, you know he doesn't use my services, which is okay with me because I think he's a dickhead anyway. But yeah. at the end of the day, it made me sort of realise that like, it's funny how you where you meet people and how you meet them and how you got along with them, how you didn't get along with them, and where they are today and how it can affect you in the future as well. Um, and it's funny how you how we always seem to talk about the dickheads, and, and it's nice for a change to hear someone like you talk about all the good blokes that you've met and how people will follow them because they're, they're the ones that make a difference. I'd nearly prefer as a company to earn less money and do good money, good work for good people than to earn good money and do it for a dickhead because, you know, it's, it's not really that enjoyable, is it? No, no. Look, the game's hard enough as it is. You know, all the stuff that we've introduced these days, and I always go back to the Super Bowls, they just get loaded up with so much stuff these days. You know, there's that much stress and you're under the pump all the time. You don't need to be doing, doing it or working with someone that you don't get on with it as well. It just it makes for a toxic environment. What's your favourite um, project you've been on? Favourite project was actually actually it wasn't even a project. We're doing maintenance for um, BHP over at uh, Kate Lambert, and it was the same there, mate. It was I got called and there was a superintendent that had um, got put up there to run the job, or site manager got put up there to run the job. Um, he got thrown into the deep end. Of, Thing, thing was a mess. The site was the company was just about to be kicked off site when he went there, and he was just, you know, he was under the pump. He was just getting smashed from left, right, and centre for everything that was going on, safety incidents, all the rest of it. And it just happened that myself and a couple other supervisors that had worked for me before came free. Now he happened to I didn't know I didn't know him, and he didn't know me, and he didn't know that I knew one of these other supervisors that we both knew. But when it come together, it was just like we just it was like we'd been working together for years. Mm. And it created that crew environment as well. The crew was still talking about it. most of my friends with us on Facebook still. And they were just it was only just yesterday actually someone was posting, oh, this was one of our RDA nights. We used to have these insane RDA nights. There was a um yacht club that was just on the back of of the site. And we used to get a bus, used to roll up, pick all of us up, take us all out there. We get to, used to book it out for ourselves, roll and drunk, fish and chips. No yeah. one ever had, there was never a blue an argument or anything like that. Put everyone on the bus, take them back to camp. Never had any dramas, never had to sack anyone, never had to fly anyone out. And it was just, it wasn't the greatest work. It was all maintenance, punch listing, that sort of thing. It was after the end of construction. So we we're finishing off work. But it was good. It was just a, a, a really good leadership team. And that spread down to the guys on the floor. And yeah, that was probably those twelve months there, mate. That if you ask any of those boys, they'd go back there tomorrow. Yeah, funny how um, good projects do get in your mind, and when you reflect back on them, they they make you smile. I had my birthday yesterday, actually, and uh, a couple of mates read on my Facebook wall, <laughs> and uh, every time I see their names. Yeah, it makes me fucking laugh pretty hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. Makes me think of the stupid shit we did and the, the camaraderie we have. And, um, you know, it made me really reiterate, you know, the importance of relationships because they're technically the only thing you take out of life. 
Yep, yep, hundred percent. I've heard you say that numerous times. Yeah, yeah it's so true. It's like at the end of it all, that's all you really got left. Yeah, mate. On, on relationships, uh, you you've got a wife and, and a couple of kids now, and so they've obviously um, you, you had a bit of a unique um, upbringing for the kids too. You never really sat in one spot. You've moved to a variety of locations with the kids. No, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, they come when I tried to avoid doing fly and fly out, so we always did. Uh, or as much as possible, I did residential projects. We went, as I said, we went to Darwin, we went down, did a little gold mine down in Bendigo, uh, Acadia. And they um, they never, that's why I laugh at the moment, all these memes going around on Facebook about oh, the kids have been home for two days and, you know, the teacher's drunk and the, the kids have been expelled and all the rest of it. Uh, my kids never ever set foot inside of school, ever, ever. It was a decision that we consciously made early on in the piece after reading um one of Rob Kiyosaki's books, actually, which was if you want to be rich and happy, don't go to school. And I didn't like school for different reasons. My wife um, didn't do uh, – well, she did academically. She's very smart, did very well at school, but she uh, was bullied a lot at school, so she, the school system didn't really suit her type of personality either. And we went, you know, we're not going to accept that for our kids. So neither of them ever went to school. Um as I say, everyone's worried about it at the moment what's going to happen if the kids sit at home for a few months or whatever. As a, my daughter's down in Melbourne at the moment studying law, got herself into uni and done that. And my young bloke's well, he's not home at the moment because he's out running his fitness business. So, you know, the, the school and the school system is outdated and it needs a complete overhaul. And it's not the be all and end all. Kids will learn what they want, to, what they need to learn. And even look at yourself and myself, you know. We, we weren't born on computers. I didn't even had computers when I went to school. And then the stuff that we're doing these days, it's all about if you want to learn something, the information's out there, go and find it and do it. I'll talk about your content in a little bit, buddy. It's on the it's on the agenda to talk about. But it's funny how you talk about schooling. You know, I've I've been looking at it real differently. And you're one of the guys that I first met when you when you first told me that, obviously me and you've been mates for a while now, I just I blew out because I've never actually met someone who'd had um, done that to their kids. And when you look at institutions like school, you know, you rock up, you're a poor kid, you're a poor kid, you rock up to school, you're a silly kid, and, you know, everyone thinks you're dumb, you know, or whatever. You, know, you get labelled or branded real quickly in, in that social environment or that, in an institutional environment. And then you look at the people that are probably teaching your kids, and nothing against teachers. I think a lot of them add a fair bit of value, but it's all very institutionalised, isn't it, where, you know, the kid goes to school and they finish school and they go to high school and they finish high school and they go to university, which is another school, and then they go back to school again. Yeah, mate. Uh, so, um, look, I've got a cousin that's a teacher and he, he's, um, he actually got out and went and travelled for a couple of years when he did finish uni, I think, and uh, he, he still says to this day he, he's a most practical t- school teacher, I sort of know, and he went to London. He said that was the best experience was going and doing that, getting out. Getting you know, getting out of the that system because as you say, the school systems aren't designed for one thing, yeah. which is to train more school teachers. Did, because as you just said, you go to primary school, you go to high school, you go to uni, you go back to school. It's quite similar to the mining industry, and it's hierarchy, isn't it? You know, it's a bit like these rosters that come about. And you know, I could probably talk about, um, you know, foreman, superintendent. You know, uh, I think that them sort of titles come from like a, well, especially superintendent. You know, they come from, I guess, an army background. Is that right? I don't know where our workforce sort of in, inherited their uh, their status of positions. Do you know? Oh, oh, don't, mate. That's actually a really good question because uh, I was reading a book the other day. Where do these things actually come from? And so much of this stuff that we never question uh, and we don't understand where it comes from. And it was, I was reading a book on, because you know, I'm high on efficiency called, uh, it was an, a scrum in the field book. And they were talking about interviews and this guy went to this um, place that, that was a TV show, whatever, they were running interviews. And they said, we can't run interviews back to back. He wanted to run these two interviews back to back. And they said, why not? They said, I don't know, it's just a rule. You can't run interviews back to back. It doesn't fucking work. Anyway, so he thought that this doesn't make any sense. So he went and when he chased it down, in the end, he found out from one of the old directors the reason that they don't run interviews back to back is because of the old reel to reel systems. You remember those? Mm. You might, might not even remember. No, that. I don't know. <laughs> they used to have these things called reel to reel. And what used to happen is they'd recall one and then they didn't have time to set it up and do the next one straight back to back. So when they'd switch to digital from reel to reel, they'd still kept the old rule where you can't run uh, interviews back to back. And so often in life, the, the school system, what you're just talking about, a hierarchy on sites and stuff like that, 
is off a rule from something that was relevant 10, 20, 50 years ago, and it doesn't make any sense anymore. Mm. And you're starting to see changes in in position titles. Like obviously there's also like a – you know, I see it in, in, in engineering mates who have, you know, starting to get titles like now managers and general managers and some of them are really actually emotionally in tune, which is good to see from a, a younger generation coming point of view and, and not seeing that, you know, typical hard stance, maybe I won't say, uh, I guess like baby boomer, you know, this is our way, mm-hmm. so it's always been done. But to bring that flexibility in and that different change of, you know, job titles and, you know, relatability from all different angles. I think so. I think you're 100% right in the track that you're going down here, Finn. We need to start really looking at titles as you know, and get rid of them and looking more at the skill set. What's the skill set that we actually need? What are the, what's the top three things that this person needs to be able to do to do this position effectively yeah. rather than, oh, he's a superintendent or he's a construction manager or whatever it may be? Everyone wants that ex- previous experience, mate. Let's talk about – let's get off that topic because that could go down like a whole other podcast, <laughs> I think. But uh, let's um, talk about residential mining. You know, you've always been residential. I've got an office in Cobar. I've got an office in New Zealand. I've got an office in Kalgoorlie. And the reason – obviously, I'm a Cobar kid originally. So, yeah. you know, i am always been a real big residential fan. I do have fly-in, fly at workers. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, end of the day, this is part of the beast that it is today. And I don't, I've got nothing against fly-in, fly because it suits – a lot of people, you know, some of my yeah. best mates love flying flight. And I used to, I've done a bit of flying flight myself. I actually didn't mind it as a young fella. Um, but as I've gotten older and wiser and gray hair and meet guys like yourself, what do you think that, you know, you would have seen it change from residential to fly in, fly out? And now we're nearly back at that point again where I'm actually about to start another marketing campaign with this, you know, COVID-19 situation where, you know, residential is back on the table again. Like if you live in an area, you need to work in that area because you can't fly anywhere. Yeah, but a hundred percent. Like at the risk of not, I don't want to harp on with that cabin on it. But the, this is going to change the world, right? And make no mistake about it. The way that the world was February twenty twenty, it's not going to be the way that the, we're not just going to go back to what we had before. Hundred um, percent. There is a lot of upside to the residential mining. The fact that you're home every night, you get to see your kids all the time. People's mental health, mate. Like the FIFO industry. It's not great for that side of things. You put in a camp, if you've got someone that's already a little bit susceptible to that sort of thing, um, you're basically setting them up to fail. Mate, I've had guys that worked for me for years and years and years. You're like, one bless it. I can't go, right? And nothing would upset him. And just on the middle of one job, he just broke. Yeah. So you never know who it is, who it's going to be. And I think the residential for and what you're pushing, and it's not practical all the time, unfortunately. You just can't do it all of the time. But as much as possible, I think it's definitely something that we need to look at more. Oh, I even think from a social point of view, like you said, oh, mate, cracking, you know, like, you know, I was talking to an old fella in Kalgoorlie the other day, actually an old fella in Boulder, um, real old school miner, and, and actually he was telling me how, like, I said, how many divorces happened back in the day? He's like, yeah, look, there was a little bit, obviously, naturally, but yeah. he said, you know, they're eight-hour shifts, so, uh, you know, someone someone mowing your lawn were pretty short. Um, but mm-hmm. also on the flip side of that, he said that, you know, you had that residential feel, you know, you had that community feel. Um, you had a bit more um, time on your hands and – I don't know, it sort of, you know, paints the picture to me that, you know, suicide and depression and, you know, divorces and, you know, divorces, you know, that's a big topic alone, you know, that's not just the individuals having an issue, that's usually kids involved as well who got to go through that shit as well. And they just weren't around back then when it was all residential or they weren't as, as common. Definitely, mate. definitely not as prevalent. And look, in, in this industry, like I'm still married, I did FIFO for... I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I suppose, and to still be married is a rarity. It, the exception, not the rule. Um, so, as I said, the, we're going back to the extreme ownership. The companies need to start having a look at this and taking a bit more ownership because they do push these rosters, they push the fly in, fly out, all the rest of it. It's more economically viable, whatever it may be. But we need to look a bit deeper into what are the impacts of these things and how do we manage them better. I know. Um, Yourself, you try to get back to an even time roster, which I think is the next step that everyone needs to get to, mm. is that shorter swings and an even time roster and swapping people in and out more regularly. These days are going back. I mean, I can remember back uh, when I was out at Prominent Hill, we're doing up to six weeks at stretch yeah. sometimes. 
and you're home for a week. You know, like the first two or three days at your home, you're absolutely correct. Mm. So, you, you know, you're no good to your family or, or anyone else anyway. So, yes, it, it's, I mean, it's getting better, but we're not there. Mm. We're, we're still a long way from where we need to be. Yeah, interesting times, hey. It's just, it's just an interesting topic. Like, I, I like talking about it because it's not. I'm not either against or for it or whatever. I just think we need to be talking about it because, uh, you know, some guy goes, oh, it works for me. And that's sweet if it works for you, but we all need to be mindful it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah, exactly. And look, it might work for people at different times too, Finny. I've heard, and again, I've heard you talk about before the 20 year old Finny, what, you know, he was thinking and how what was relevant for him at the time is different to 30 year olds. Yeah. You know, and that can change. Like when you're young, get out of your time, you want to go away and get in a camp, put some money in the bank. Yeah, it's fantastic. But, you know, five, 10 years down the track, that might not be so much such a, um, uh, a shiny object, you know, for, <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely, mate. Um, yeah, another good topic, mate. I just wanted to highlight it again. I, I knew you'd have a bit of value data around that topic as well because obviously you've done well both, you know, and not everybody's done what you've done, mate. Like, you know, I don't know if you've got a, actually got a community as well, what wouldn't mind knowing. This is the question I asked you. With the kids not going to school and, and you just traveling around doing the residential stuff, you know, you, know, you guys must have been pretty involved and you must have a pretty good relationship with, with, with your kids. But is it was there many people you come across that did what you guys did as well? It's actually a surprisingly bigger number than what you realise. So wherever you went, there's always a homeschooling group. Now, well, we didn't sort of really fit into those groups either because a lot of them are uh, extremely alternative, I suppose. Hippie. Um, yeah, pretty much, yeah, <laughs> for want of a better word, and which we don't really fit into that sort of category. We sort of didn't really fit that as well either. But... I mean, there's always sporting clubs, mate. Like, you go back to, you know, my young blaze, Mad King Cricketer, has been since he could, what's his name, walk and run, roll his arm over sort of thing. Yep. So he's always had his cricket. He played soccer as well. Um, they always had other hobbies and interests. My daughter was into horse riding. Um, what was her, her riding and that sort of thing. So she always found book clubs or all these other clubs. It's, look, unfortunately, the school system's like just like a, a giant babysitting thing really and, and we're seeing evidence of that at the moment where here they won't shut the schools because they know if they shut the schools what are the parents going to do to look after the kids yeah so it is a big investment in time um uh, like my wife stayed home with them and made sure that that all happened while you know while i worked she she always she always had a far harder job than i did because she had to get get that done and um but there's plenty of, mate this day and age a group, a support group of some sort is, you know, basically at the end of your mess. You can find someone and if you can't, create one. Mm, yeah. There's always ways around it. Yeah, always putting yourself out there doesn't hurt, that doesn't hurt even, mate. That's probably, that's probably a key message too, hey, like, you know, I've been in situations where you have been in pretty dark holes and sometimes you just got to – I remember a mate said to me once – you know, I've always been a rugby league, rugby union player, and literally he's right. You just rock up to any rugby union club, no matter what your skill level is. Um, obviously, you still get your egos, which are the really good rugby players versus the really shit ones, and then you get the ones that are, you know, a bit like the workplaces. You know, someone gets the, the manager title, so they think they're different and better than you. Um, yep. At the end of the day, there's still a sense of community there, and um, we all drink the same water, and we still all eat the same food. We all sort of play the same games at different levels. Yeah. And you'll always find what you're looking for too, Finny. Like if you think, oh, this is going to be shit or, you know, yeah. I'm not going to fit in here and all the rest of it, you won't. If you, if you go along with the attitude of, you know, how can I meet some people, how do I make this work, you'd be surprised what happens. Yeah, um, it, I think uh, embracing everyone's uh, uniqueness is, is a big one as well. You know, plenty, 100%. Of, plenty of yeah, unique 100%. people out there, Beanie. <laughs> there is, mate. There is, there, you know. There's, there, are, there isn't two the same, and it's all about being a bit more tolerant. You look in the mirror. I look in the mirror every day, mate, and have a laugh at myself. <laughs> <laughs> you got to laugh, yeah. <laughs> mate. Um, but what, what are you doing these days? You, you do you pump out some content and some good stuff. Like I'm always me and you are Facebook friends, obviously, but you pump out some pretty good content. And we've talked about podcasts and we've talked about doing a few things together and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, we're still on that journey of conversation. But um, where did the marketing bug come from, mate? Like obviously, you, you're looking for a, uh, you're available for work at the moment. At the time of this podcast, by the time it gets yeah. aired, you probably already have work, depending on what's going on with, with the world. But um, I, I don't know. What would you reckon you specialise in, and how did you get into that market? 
market marketing side of things or that business development side of things? Right. So back in 2008, I think it was, I'd, actually when I was in Bendigo, I learned to trade options. And I did that for about two years while I was still working. I was doing pretty well. And um, basically got to the point where I couldn't miss. Every, every trade I put on, it, it would come off because we're still in a, in a bull market at that point. Yeah. So in 2008, I went, oh, fuck this. I'm just going to, you know, just trade and spend time with the kids and bought Tinny and we went fishing and did uh, spent a lot of time with them actually, about, about 12 months. It was fantastic. Best thing I ever did. But as you know, 2000, end of 2008, the trade started drawing up as we come into that um, where she dropped off the cliff and we hit that recession or whatever it was, that black day in the market. Yeah. And pretty much wrote everything off. But before that, I'd been, because I was home and under with the kids, I was a bit bored. And there was some training come online, a thing called The Challenge, run by a guy named Ed Dale in Australia. And it was basically, and it was um, take your hobbies and learn how to make some money off it online. And my missus said, you drive me nuts, go and learn how to do this. Yep. So I did. And we got to the end of it anyway. The stuff that we've just taught you said, you've got better than an MBA in marketing now. So my, the, the bullshit that they um, teach in universities and stuff around marketing, I mean, how can uh, a university professor that's never run a business, never had to make, make a sale, but can teach marketing. It's a, a you know, that's another rant for another day. Yeah. But anyway, he said you've got a better than a university degree. He said businesses are getting screwed by these big companies with their branding and all the rest of the bullshit. He said you need to go out and start teaching them what you've just learned. So I did. <laughs> Always been. Well, I'm not a well, think about it. I just go out, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't, adjust it. And, and move on sort of thing. So it, it all started from that, I suppose, mate. Then um, I got a um, – there was a, a program we up in Glasgow at the time called uh, Project Grow, which was just trying to get businesses to start getting online. At that stage, they were basically trying to convince them just that mobile phones were coming in and they'd tell them uh, websites, you know, to make your website mobile friendly. And Facebook was very, very new. It was like I got in right, right from the start. And I just started teaching that and – Decided I like making videos, so I started pumping the videos out. But it's actually got to the point now, I've, I've changed my angle now rather than trying to teach people how to market. It's how to actually use those tools constructively because it's, it's come to the point that these phones are, um, and apps are designed by what are called uh, attention engineers, which are, these guys used to um, make poker machines and shit like that. And that the poker machines were designed, obviously, to keep people sitting in front of them, the noises, the colours, all the rest of it. They understand all these things and they've transferred that across to the apps on the phones. And that's why they're so highly addictive. So my thing these days is more about um, getting people to, to use these platforms, but to have, for them to use them, not the platform to use them, if you know what I mean, yeah. because most people are just in a constant state of distraction, driven by the email and what's popping up on their social media feed. Yeah, you just become part of the um, part of the part of the, the the line, aren't you? Really, you're following it all the way into the tunnel. Exactly, right. Exactly. You know, you know and you walk around the shops and stuff like that. Most people can't tear their eyes off their phone long enough to you know walk from one shop to the next. I, and, or I always call it the uh, the the sh- um, shopping queue test. If you stand in a shopping queue and you're fit and your default reaction is to reach for your phone and pull it out while you're bored for two seconds to see what the latest update is mm. and you've got a problem, you need to do something about it. Yeah, it's funny. What do they spend? I can't remember. I heard a figure the other day, and I don't want to say it because it was a stupid, stupid figure of how much like Australia alone spends on marketing to sell people stuff. Oh, look, I couldn't. Give you a figure, Finny, but I tell you what, ninety percent would be a waste of time. Mm, yeah, I, mean, I remember being like a sh- like, and that, that's all to grab. Like you know, it's a lot mm. of resources. It's all to grab our attention. Grab a bit of attention, yeah. And it, like, there's good ways of doing it and, and bad ways of doing it. And if you use it as a like what you're doing here as an educational tool, it's exceptional because you give people information they can actually take the stuff away and use it to better themselves. But 90% of it's just, hey, look at me, I'll buy my shit sort of thing. Yeah, awesome. And that that marketing is dying because people just don't pay attention to it anymore. They're, it used to be, right, you had to get something like before all the um, internet and all the rest of it, you had to get your know, message in front of people somewhere between about five to 12 times before they'd actually feel comfortable see your brand to um, come and do business with you. 
Now what they um, worked out is somewhere because of all, all the marketing messages that were smashed with, it's like 20 to 30 times. That's why most businesses use Facebook and stuff and post something one or two times and what they post is probably fucking crap anyway. But they post something, hey, buy this, and they send it out once and they think people are going to race in and buy off it and they don't. It's because they're not, it comes back to that word we talked about for earlier, is they just don't build the relationship first. There's no value added on the front end before they ask for that sale. Mm. Mate, it's um, it's an in-depth conversation. That's why I'm very fortunate I get to have these conversations with guys like you and pick your brains. Um, mm. Mate, what, what reference point can you refer people back to as a, as a real good guide for people to tap into? Gary V is definitely one, yeah, 100%. Uh, and Dale. There's another guy in Australia. Follow any of his stuff. Uh, Frank Kerr is one of my favourites. Um, there's a guy in Australia as well, uh, Nathan Nathaniel Bibby. He's really, really good on LinkedIn. Jump on him. And the other one that I really, really, really recommend is Kerwin Ray. Yeah, Kerwin Ray's good, eh? Yeah, yeah he's, he's exceptional. He's not... But you look at most of his, his business coaching and stuff like that, Finny, but look at most of it. Most of it's around about uh, self-improvement, relationships, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, he is. I, I, got, I, I haven't – I've seen his stuff on Facebook. I know he always, he's always coming with feed, so he's obviously doing something right. Um, I've listened to a few of his podcasts as well. He's got a podcast as well, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he has, mate. Yeah. yeah. Unstoppable, I think it's cool. Yeah. Um, and back on the, the mumba mentality – you know, yep. what, what is that and how did that come about? Like, you, you know, your way, the, the book I hear the most out of you is, is Atomic Habits. Yep, yep. So Atomic Habits, in there they talk about the uh, aggregation of marginal gains, which is basically is making uh, – people want the big um, road to Damascus type <laughs> this become an overnight success, if you want, okay? But – it's all about stacking up little things every day. And if you can make just a 1% improvement every day in what you're doing, at the end of three, if you do that 365 days in a row, you're 37 times better off at what you're doing. So if you're podcasting and you start off and you make small incremental improvements all the way through, that gets gets you to, you know, by the end of the year, you're 37 times better at it. Most people just won't stick out anything that long to do it. Well, the, the mumba mentality is the exact same thing and it comes back to um, – one of the guys that when you talk about people to follow, unfortunately, earlier this year he passed away, was uh, Kobe Bryant. And he basically the, the mama mentality is the exact same thing. It's, it's, it's not a, a way of life. Uh, it's a way of life. It's not a bravado or something else. It's just trying to get incrementally better. Because he tells a story about um, both his dad and his uncle were exceptional basketball players. And he went to this um, uh, uh what do you call it? It was a con- competition that was on when he was about 11 years old and he played the whole season. He never, he never ever even scored a goal. And his dad just said to him, don't worry about it. He said, I'll, I'll love you no matter what you what you do, whether you become a basketball player or not. And he decided at that point, I was when he was 11 years old, he decided, oh, I'm going to be the greatest basketball player of all time. And he basically started making these little improvements, started working on his jump shots, started working on his layups, his dribble and all the rest of it to the point where at 16, 17 year old, he was the hottest property in, in basketball. Yeah, freak too. Yeah, uh, but he, he won the freak to start with. That, that's his point. Mm. He, uh, you know, he was average. He w- wasn't even, didn't even, played a whole season and didn't even, didn't even score a point. I interviewed so, I interviewed Casey Stoner on the podcast. I don't know if you've heard that podcast of Casey. And... Um, I said to him, I said something along the lines, like, how did it feel hanging out with, you know, you know, Valentino Rossi? Actually, I don't think he's a big fan of Valentino, just quietly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I asked him and, and he was like, he's like, fuck, mate, I put a lot of work in to get here. Yeah. Like everything. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what people don't realise. They see talent. When you see talent, that's thousands and thousands of hours of practice, mm. of fucking it up, of not working, all the rest of it. They don't, they don't just – yes, they might have a uh, an ability to be able to um, do something better than everyone else to start with or whatever, but that level of mastery that they get to, that that's that's a lot of work. Mm. Mate, it's um, it's something that we all got to be uh, – you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the, to the topic of resilience. And then all of a sudden, like you look at Kobe, he only died you know, a couple of months ago, didn't he? And um, just randomly, no, no one seemed to come in. 
No, no. But the thing is that I say, and people that I say to people with that is that mentality, that mama mentality that he lived. He lived more like I think he was only in his early forties or something like that. His life, he did more in that life, those forty years, than most people will do in eighty, hundred. You know, couldn't do in three lifetimes. Yeah, because because of that mentality of getting that small improvements every day. Yeah, mate, and one foot in front of another, mate, and I think that's um, absolutely critical, isn't it? It is, it is. It's, you know, we all want instant gratification. It's what, again, coming back to the marketing, everyone wants to tell you a hack or a quick, easy way. There, There isn't a quick, easy way. No, <laughs> there was everyone to do it. No, you're right, mate. I, I, I actually, um, you, you, you can tell if you I've done a lot of obviously self reflection myself, but you know, I used to get like, you know, oh, you know, a bit of a, a bit of an ego about me, you know, where I'm thinking, you know, oh, he's doing that, I'm doing this, and then eventually, you know, I'm only young too. I've sort of just got to a point where I just don't give a fuck anymore, you know. Whereas, like, I just do what I can do and what I can control, and take my own actions, and then eventually, when you when you carry that attitude, you find yourself like in an abundance of energy an abundance of clarity and an abundance of like you know the people that used to you know make you feel certain ways or think certain ways don't do that anymore you're in control definitely definitely the the less you worry about what everyone else thinks about you and the more you worry about what you can as you say you can control and you can improve Mm. uh the better off you'll be actually another really good books that go with that is the um uh the subtle art of not giving a fuck Mm-hmm. And everything is fucked by Mark Manson. If you haven't read those, or listen to those. I need to get that one. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Uh-huh. Get those, um, mate. Um, really appreciate your insight and your time today. Cause you, you've obviously um, given it up um, um, to um, nice and early there too, isn't it? What's the time there? Nine o'clock, eight o'clock. Yeah, something like that's not too yeah. bad. Yeah. Eight um, o'clock, mate. Just what, eight o'clock. What's um, what's your what's your sort of niche these days? What what sort of work? Like you, you do everything from last time I spoke to you, last time we caught up in Brisbane, you were doing a shutdown for Monadelpha, so you were I think you were project manager or superintendent um there in that role. Um, so you, you your flexibility in role. What sort of um, roles can you do, and what sort of roles do you feel that you add the most value? Okay, so the one un, until. Actually, when I reached out to you last year when we were talking and you recommended the book uh, Rocket Fuel, I think it was. And then I read well, you know, Rocket Fuel Traction, one of, one yeah. of those. Rocket, types of books Rocket, Fuel, Rocket Fuel usually first and then, then you go yeah. down the traction route. Yeah, right. And I talk about the two types of um, people, in, well, the two types of business owners in that book, I suppose. And I've always been going down the track of either working for myself or, you know, having some sort of a role that's a high-level type thing. And they talk about, and there you've got your visionary, which is uh, guys like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, yourself, that, you know, Mate, have... Mate, pri- 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 privilege to be <laughs> named amongst him too. <laughs> <for each other. laughs> um, that see things that other people don't and they... Um, but, that Elon Musk is a freak, isn't he? Uh, look, and again, it, it all comes back to what, like he was, I think when he sold PayPal, he was living on his mum's couch so he could buy into something else, you know? So there's the sacrifices that, that come with getting those people to those points. Didn't, didn't, he, didn't he recently, I haven't listened to it, didn't he smoke marijuana on someone's podcast? Who was that? I think he did, yeah. Who <laughs> was it? Joe Rogan. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be right. Yeah, yeah, Joe Rogan was actually. Yeah, yeah, they reckon it affected his shares too. I only read the article. I didn't. I haven't listened to the podcast yet, but they reckon uh, it affected his shares as well. Yeah, right. I must go back and watch that one. Yeah. Oh, well, it would only be a short term thing anyway. Oh, I'm so sure hard, it is, mate. I don't think someone yeah. as wealthy as him isn't he like <laughs> building tunnels and everything through different yeah. cities. Mate, he's a, you've got a finger in everything. Yeah, he's a tripper. Um, Mate, yeah, so them sort of guys, you know, obviously yeah. they obviously lead down the path. Of, you, you feeling like you feel fit into the integrator category? Is that what yeah, you yeah. That's end up the, discovering? Yeah, yeah. The other roles are the integrator, which is they're like the, the make those uh, visions and the dreams, I suppose, if you like, turn those into reality, put the, the, the systems in place, make sure that, you know, uh, number one, a, a quote from the type of habits is you don't rise to level of goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So... You know, when, when everything turns to shit, you can see how well how robust your systems are and how how well they're working. By you know um, how well that you deal with a bad situation, what sort of situations that we've got at the moment. So that made a lot of sense to me when I read that book because um, 
they just explained uh, where I did, what I did and how I actually fit in. And I was just talking to a guy about this the other day. I was like, I always used to get it. I haven't had it so much recently, but years and years ago, whenever it was like, oh, Benny's coming on site, the person that would know me that was coming on site would be, yeah, that's good because he'll make shit happen. Yeah. And that's what, what I've always um, done. That's a role that I've always fit into. And it's always revolved around, number one, the leadership and identifying my dad. Again, come back to my dad. He anyway, always taught me as an apprentice, if you're not training someone up to take your job, then you're not doing your job. So you've always got to have that understudy. So you can't expect to step up to the next level unless there's someone there to replace you when you move up. Mm. So it's about, yeah, leadership, training those people up that are underneath you. And then I've come to with getting into site managers' roles and stuff like and superintendent roles is about the planning, tracking that planning, budgeting, all those sorts of things. So that, that's where I sit. Uh, they're the skill set that I do and I do well and what I'm looking for in the future. What sort of advice do you give to people that are a little bit unsure? Because I've been unsure a lot in my life and I didn't know where to go or what to do and eventually I just ended up taking action on one thing that I was half keen on and then yep. got down to a certain avenue where I thought, you know what, change again, you know, adapt. What sort of advice do you give to people that are actually really uncertain in their life at the moment in, in different areas, but, uh, you know, especially around the work fronts and what they should do? What you just said, mate, is you've got to take take some sort of action. It won't necessarily be the exactly right action. And they've done interviews of people that have all made it and they're, they're talking people like uh, your jobs, your Elon Musk and all the rest of it and all, all built successful, maybe not even to that level, but built uh, successful businesses. And they said to them, is this what, what you started out doing? Is this it now? And they all said, no. Nah. So whatever they started out with didn't quite work and that they worked out along the line, well, I don't like doing this or I do like doing that or I'm not good at doing this. And this is, that's another important point. It's not only is it imper- imperative to know what you're good at, it's imperative to know what you're not fucking good at as well. I'm being honest with it enough with yourself to say, I'm shit at that. I need someone else that, that is good at that to be able to do that for me. Yeah. So that's, that would be the thing that I would say is start something. You know, I mean, you can go and start a podcast today for free. Go and download an app on your phone and start doing a podcast. Go. Actually, that, that would be the thing that I, I would recommend is get out there and in it like, like you're doing now. Is if, you, if you've got a certain direction that you want to head in, reach out to people. Use LinkedIn. Go and talk to them. Say, hey, we do an interview. Probably the quickest, easiest way that that is to open up doors because people will always love to talk about themselves, even me. Yeah. No, it's right. I, I, I love it because I get two platforms. I get to give a, a, in the audience to something to listen to and I also get to, um, you know, pick people's brains and have a conversation. Like, you know, the, it's, it's a lot of stuff me and you spoke about today is probably a bit of reiteration to what we spoke about over the last year or so. Um, but there's also so many different podcasts. Yeah, even mining podcasts. I think uh, – what's got a couple of mates that do podcasts. Um, Maddie Michaels, Your Life and Mine. Uh, Mine, uh, yep. There's another guy called um, Beneath the Surface, um, Sean Levin. He's a good fella too. Yeah. There's heaps out there. Like, that's you know, just mining, you know. You'd be into a fair few podcasts from mining, the different sort of stuff, wouldn't you? What, what sort of podcast do you get into? I don't have time to listen to all of them like – I've yeah. only, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Joe Rogan. I don't mind the um, the big fella Tony Robbins. He, he has some interesting conversations yeah. sometimes, a little bit deeper. Another guy yeah. I do like too. Um, what's that? Russell Brand, the, not not the the comedian, the comedian yeah, guy. Yeah. Yep. What can't yeah, his he, name? He's got some really insightful stuff. Actually. Yeah, the big lanky fella. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What are you? Yeah. What are you Russell into, Brand. mate? Mate. Um, Probably one of the top of – actually, one that I've listened to for years and years and years is I Love Marketing. And whether you think you're in uh, marketing or not, yeah, okay? So you've got to market yourself and sell yourself no matter whether you think you've got a product to sell or you think you don't. Even if you just want a job, you've got to be able to market yourself. So go and listen to that stuff. Uh, Tom Bilyeu is another excellent one, Impact Theory. Um, just trying to think what else I should put my podcast list up while I'm here. i as I say, there's a podcast basically in every niche and less doing podcasts. Another really good one about getting efficient, becoming efficient. The one thing from the One Thing book, uh, TED Talks, always fantastic to listen to as well. Kerwin Ray, we mentioned before, Unstoppable. Uh, Mind Valley is another really 
your one. Um, Fushin Lakiani, that's another exceptional book that I recommend. Actually, it's called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind. I, I think the, yeah. the girls are going to be busy, mate, writing down all your reference points for the show, <laughs> for the show notes. <laughs> um, mate, really appreciate your insight, buddy. I'm, I'm going to try and wrap it up a little bit So I've got a few yep. things to run on to, and I know uh, you'll probably keep it occupied while keep, keeping my news feed um, busy. Um, <laughs> it's funny, every time I jump on Facebook, I always see your shit, and I'm like, shit, this bloke like, literally is in my face every time I jump on any social media platform. <laughs> um, so, um, mate, the, the question I got for you is um, – you know, before I get into your contact details to help people can get hold of you and all that sort of stuff, what um, what makes you know? I usually ask this question to everyone. What makes you nervous and excited about the the mining industry or the industry in the world in general? Because uh, you're a pretty worldly sort of man. You're in, in a lot of different industries, but I, 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 you know, we talked about how we've got a lot of similarities. So there must be a fair bit that makes you nervous and excited about us moving forward. Yeah, the excited is the technology. Uh, the stuff that's coming through at the moment is insane. The virtual reality, the augmented reality, 3D scanning, all the rest of them. Um, so that tech side of it is awesome. And the kids that are coming through with it know how to use it really well. And we need to, again, look, the likes of you and I didn't come through in that generation. We need to work out how to work with them and uh, use that stuff better and get it implemented quicker. What worries me is the fact that we're not adapting quick enough. <laughs> nowhere near quick. Nowhere near quick enough. And we've still got so many old ideas. We spoke about this earlier, like the real-to-real thing. We're still clinging on to these old ideas, these old org structure um, concepts, all the rest of it. We need to get away from that and work out. Um, another big read of mine is, is um, P6 and uh, what do you call them? schedules. Schedules don't work. Haven't worked. Never have work, worked. Never will work. And we need to find better ways to track and work out where we're going and what we're doing so that we can start getting um, or making our mining and our construction, all the rest of it, a lot more productive and that we can compete on that um, in the world, in that space. Mm. Yeah, adaptability, mate. It's key, isn't it? It is, mate. It is. And look, there's no point saying, oh, it's cheaper labour overseas, all the rest of it. We've got advantages that they don't have. Mm. Cheaper labour is not the, the be all and end all, and we need to work with this technology we've got coming through to leverage the kids that know how to use this shit better and put the older experienced people with the younger ones and get those working better together. And, you know, there's no reason why we can't compete on anything that we want to compete on in Australia or, or New Zealand. I'm unsure, mate, if you've got me more nervous and excited about that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, mate, really be a bit of buts. You'd always be a bit of buts. Oh, yeah. You should always be a bit scared and a bit yeah. excited. It's funny, you know, everyone who asks that question too usually gives you know, a, a statement like you do just then where you're sort of a bit of both. You know, it's, yeah. it's the good shit, but it's also, yeah. hey, this is the flip side. Um, how risky are you willing to be to make sure we get a different result? Yeah. Mate, um, to wrap it up, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I don't think this will be your last podcast. I think me and you have got plenty of conversation to have, plenty of different topics to have um, around a lot of things. I know me and you are going to get better, especially my end, to create some time for me and you to have a chat. Um, but in the meantime, I really appreciate you coming on, mate, and giving us your time. What's the best way for people to reach out and touch base with you, Beanie? Mate, probably LinkedIn's the best one. For me, um, I'm pretty easy to find on there. Just type Adam Bean into there. Uh, I'm sure you'll put a link in the show notes or whatever or go through yourself. But, yeah, LinkedIn is probably the platform that I predominantly use the most for the type of work that we're talking about. Yeah, very good, mate. Um, really appreciate you coming on. I'll make sure I hook all that to the show notes as well, buddy, so everyone can touch base and say good day um, and get you on Facebook. I'm, I'm sure you can annoy the shit out of them as well. Um, <laughs> uh, really appreciate you coming on, brother. Thanks for having me, Finny. Enjoyed every minute of it. Thanks, mate. Thanks for tuning in to this interview with Adam. Check out our show notes for this episode at fullproduction.com.au for more information about Adam or his business. To connect with more like-minded miners, head on over to the Full Production Facebook group where you'll find Beanie there as well. See you next week. Cheers.